Hello there! This is Puad189, and today I'm going to be giving an introductory lesson into the Viking Age, speaking on the Vikings themselves as well as the backdrop and the significance of the age. I don't believe it's an exaggeration to state that the Scandinavians of the Viking Age were responsible for the shaping of the Western world, and were paramount in the development of most major European nation-states in the modern world. It's truly hard to overstate the political and historical importance of this time period, which is one reason why I'm making this video. Because when I first researched the Vikings, it opened my eyes to how Europe tied together in its development. And it showed me just how important the Scandinavians were. Now, let's get started. Firstly, the word Viking does not actually refer to the people themselves, at least it didn't initially. When Scandinavians of the Viking Age used the word, it meant to raid or adventure. To go a Viking, or to be out Viking, meant that they were to go adventuring, or they were adventurers. A less generous term would be raider. But Vikings explored and settled as much as they attacked and pillaged. Uh, but such were the frequency and ferocity of the attacks that the term became synonymous with the people of Scandinavia. Now, when I or any historical scholar says Scandinavia, we mean the countries of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Some consider Finland a part of the Scandinavian world, but most see them as a separate entity. They had a different language and culture, and at best the Finns were allies of the Swedes. But just remember, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. Now, you might wonder, what exactly led to the Scandinavians attacking and raiding every other civilization that they came into contact with, and even beyond? Why were they separate from their other European counterparts? Well, you see, the Scandinavians of the period were the descendants of, or you could say the last descendants, of the Germanic traditions that predated the Roman period. You could really call them the last of the Germanic peoples or tribes of antiquity that survived into the early medieval period. Now, what does that mean? Well, during the time of the Roman expansion, most notably in the period of the Empire, when Rome looked to the north, it designated the continent of Europe into three regions, excluding the Iberian Peninsula. There was Celtic Gaul, which was the modern-day regions of France, Luxembourg, Belgium, most of Switzerland, some of northern Italy, which I believe is Transalpine Gaul, as well as, or no, that's the Salpine Gaul, sorry, as well as the parts of the Netherlands and a small portion of western Germany, west of the Rhine. It was a fairly large area, particularly for the ancient Romans, and as I said, it consisted of Celtic tribes who collectively were dubbed the Gauls. Now, when most people hear of the Celts, they think of Britain, particularly in the north, and while that is accurate, the Celtic world was far larger than that. You see, throughout most of human history, people were often divided not by the color of their skin or their system of government, but by the language they spoke. This is one reason why I give little credence to those who preach for ethnostates, or white extremists, or people who are extremely anti-capitalist or communist. All of those ideas are a very recent phenomenon. In the 6,000 years of human civilization, we've only truly cared about ethnicity in the last 600 years, and governments in the last 400 years, other than a few exceptions of course, such as the Greek city-states and the like. I digress. The point is, the Gauls were mainland European Celts, and they spoke variations of a similar Celtic language. Above them was Britain, or Britannia, which was at the far ends of the world as far as the Romans were concerned, and even more distant was the land they dubbed Hibernia, which was in fact Ireland. In the British Isles, there were distinct groups of Celts, most notably the Gaelic Celts, the Insular Celts, which I believe were the Celts in the mainland, and the Picts of Scotland, and of course the Romans when they arrived. These two regions, meaning Gaul and Britannia, were considered dangerous and barbaric to early Rome. The Romans often allied with various tribes in the mainland and played them against one another and policed Gaul, you might say. However, after Julius Caesar led an eight-year campaign now called the Gallic Wars, much of the tribes were pacified, if not made into allies and clients of Rome. Of course, there were still Gallic tribes that were hostile, but still, this was no small feat. Julius Caesar had done in eight years to Gaul what Rome had taken nearly two centuries to do in Celtic Iberia. It was Caesar's first claim to fame, being one of the most impeccable commanders since Alexander the Great. During the Gallic Wars, he also made two excursions into Britain, and two excursions into the third region that I shall now speak of. 
For centuries, Gaul had been a land of barbarians to Rome, though much of this was propaganda. Yes, the Gauls were a bit bigger than Romans with wild red hair and devastating charges in battle, however, they were very sophisticated in village life. With Mott and Bailey castles, fair-sized towns, prize metalwork, trade routes, and were known for being very adept, even better than the Romans, at creating wheeled carts and harnessing for farming and transportation. Rome could, on some level, understand the Gauls, trade with them, and integrate them into Roman society. However, the people east of the Rhine were another matter. This region was known as Germania, or Germania, which encompassed most of Germany, and in fact all of Europe east of the Rhine and north of the Balkans, which included Scandinavia. These northern barbarians were not Celts. They had dealings with the Celts, and had even migrated south into Italy once or twice with devastating effect to Rome. But these people did not speak the same or even a related language to the Celts or Romans, nor did they even share similar traditions or gods. These people spoke Germanic languages, worshipped pagan gods, who were essentially proto asir or the famous Scandinavian gods of the Viking Age. I won't go into too much detail of them at the moment, but the Germanic peoples worshipped the early versions of the gods such as Odin, known as Woden in the early Germanic. The Romans would soon learn that the Celts looked like Greek scholars compared to the Germanic peoples, who truly fit the ideal of barbarians to the Romans. The people of Germania did not have castles or even towns. At best, they had village settlements, and many of them migrated as a way of life. It's the reason why the age after the fall of the Western Roman Empire is often called the Age of Migrations, because Rome no longer integrated or halted the traveling Germans, and the barbarians moved freely into Western Europe, displacing other tribes and settlements as they did so. It was one reason why people often think of the Dark Ages as chaotic. The Germanic people were also known for lacking a priestly order or caste. No priests, no druids as the Celts had. They worshipped their gods through deeds and song. The Germanic tribes also did not have armies initially, at least in the traditional sense. They were prized warriors known for their ferocity, strength, and brutality. They often solved disputes in single combat, and eventually they did have organized armies. However, as I said initially, they lacked the organization of the Roman military. Not to say that they weren't effective in mass battles. Traveling Germanic tribes could devastate Roman legions. When the Cimbri and the Teutone tribes migrated into Italy, they utterly annihilated multiple Roman legions and terrorized Rome for nearly a decade until Gaius Marius took command and pushed them back, destroying most of them. It's known as the Cimbrian War, and I'll discuss it in another video. The point is, the Germanic tribes were fearsome opponents, and merely two of the tribes migrating into Italy caused the most Roman casualties of war since the Punic Wars a century previous. However, it was easy to tactically outmaneuver them if they did not follow a single great commander, and tribes often fought one another nearly as much as they fought Celts or Romans. It's also important to note that while these people were called Germanic, many of the tribes originated in Scandinavia, and they were not simply related to people in the Rhineland via Germanic languages. For instance, if you know any Roman history, you know of the Goths, who migrated southwards and crowded Rome. Those that weren't integrated into the Roman military overran Rome, and some migrated into Spain, becoming the Visigoths. In the epic poem Beowulf, Beowulf was a Geat, or Geatos, which translates to Goth, who lived in Sweden across the small channel that separated Sweden from Denmark, meaning the famous barbarians of Rome, the Goths, were originally a tribe in Sweden, and in fact many still stayed in Sweden as Goths, or Geatos. So the Goths that invaded Rome were actually cousins of Beowulf, if Beowulf was ever a figure. Now, let's look at the Angles, who lived in central Denmark, and the Saxons, who lived just at the edge of southern Denmark. Both tribes immigrated to Britain, overtaking the mixed Roman Celtic populations and creating Anglo-Saxon Britain. And so it is important to note that Scandinavia, these tribes all came from Scandinavia. Scandinavia was in many ways the heartland of the Germanic peoples. Germany itself was called Germany because it represented the beginnings of Germania, not where most of the Germanic peoples resided or originally inhabited. So you could say that the Vikings have been raiding for thousands of years, just not always at sea. Now, when the Western Roman Empire fell, the three regions north of Italy were transformed. In summary, and I'm going to repeat this, 
Gaul became Francia, which in turn became the Frankish Empire, which then eventually became France, though not yet. Germania had been pushed back a bit, and after the Age of Migrations, much of what we know as Germany became one of the three Frankish kingdoms, the Holy Roman Empire, which was pretty much integrated Germanic peoples under Frankish institutions, and Britain went from a Celtic Roman Isle into Anglo-Saxon Britain, or more accurately, England. The Gaelic peoples still held Ireland, and the Picts were still in Scotland, and Wales also remained mostly unchanged. Now, something to note about Bronze Age and Iron Age Europe. There are misconceptions on how terrain was often handled. The fact that Germania and Gaul were separated at the Rhine wasn't because the Rhine was a barrier, the Rhine being the famous Rhine River. The Rhine was, in fact, a line of communication, as most rivers were. It was the deep forests that truly separated peoples. Forests so thick they shaped and ripped at the very earth. These forests were one of the many reasons why the Germanic peoples did not have towns or castles. The land was too thick with trees and beasts. It was also one reason why the Romans found it so difficult to invade Germania. The Germanic peoples were so excellent at ambush tactics and they could fade into the trees and were hard to pursue, and Roman engineering did very little when there were no large settlements to besiege. Now, as I said, the age after Rome is often called the Age of Migrations. Many also consider it a part of the so-called Dark Ages, and it's also referred to as the Age of Heroes, which is my favorite term for the time. The reason why it's called the Age of Heroes is because many of the epics that we know of today were founded and penned during that period, such as Beowulf. Most of them were Germanic epics. Um, other than Beowulf, there, were Rolf, there was the adventures of Rolf Kraki, of Sigurd, and even Attila the Hun was in certain Germanic stories known as Atli. This denotes a wider unity of spread Germanic culture. However, as the centuries progressed, the Frankish institutions which built upon the Roman institutions grew in power. The former Germanic peoples that lived in Francia and England became distant to their Scandinavian homeland. Here's an example. Take someone from Denmark and Anglo-Saxon England in the year 500, and they can more or less understand one another. However, by the year 800, their languages, while similar, would be more or less indistinct from one another. The Norse language notably grew fewer syllables in their sentences, for instance. Not to say that their sentences became dumbed down, but it, they spoke in a, a more gruff and curt manner. Christianity also began to spread, becoming the state religion of the Franks, famously in the year 800 with the crowning of Charlemagne. Britain also became Christianized, and soon the Germanic myths and gods, at least in mainland Europe and in Britain, were lost to time in all but the homeland. As the languages and culture changed or evolved, and the great forests that separated Scandinavia and mainland Europe were as ferocious as ever and used less, Scandinavia became a distinct and unique society compared to other European counterparts. I realize I just spent a whole lot of background of Europe as a whole, but I felt it was paramount to understand why Scandinavians and the Vikings were a very separate culture from Carolingian or Frankish Europe and those who lived in Britain, as well as different from the Celts who still remained in Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Now, to restate this in a different fashion, just to hammer it home, the Age of Migrations went on, Gaul evolved into the Frankish Empire and it instituted Christianity. The Angles and Saxons invaded Britain, creating Anglo-Saxon Britain and creating the Five Kingdoms, East Anglia, the Kingdom of Northumbria, Bernicia, Wessex, and Mercia. Below the Scandinavian heartland, the Frisians were staunch pagans, trading partners and cultural Germanic brothers to the Scandinavians until the 8th century, the Frisians living it in the modern-day Netherlands, essentially. Once the Frisians were either conquered or integrated into the Holy Roman Empire, the Saxons were next, having held out against the Franks until Charlemagne conquered them after decades of campaigning. The Saxons of the mainland, I mean, not those in Britain. What I'm trying to get at here is that the Frisians and the Saxons, those that were once trading partners to the Scandinavians in mainland Europe, their last friends, now considered them savages, foreigners, or heretics. Those who were once cultural brothers to them, even descendants to them. Throughout the Age of Migrations, trade had been just as important as conquest or migration, and much of continental Europe had been invaded by Germanic peoples. But as civilization began to form and stabilize, and Christianity and Frankish and Celtic traditions began to integrate with Germanic traditions, 
it became far more different to the Scandinavians than similar in culture. Europe had changed. Yes, there were still Germanic influences, but they were under Roman institutions mixed with people of Celtic blood and traditions. The Scandinavians were the last true Germanic peoples and Germanic pagans left, and they now saw the Christian Europeans as rivals, if not prey, to pay tribute to their gods. Now that I've hammered home the backstory and motivation of the Vikings in the Viking Age, let's talk about the Scandinavians themselves. The Scandinavians did make some advancements since the Roman Age. They were no longer people who chose migration as a way of living, at least on the land. And uh, it would only be later when they decided to migrate via ship. They gained metallurgical skills and knowledge from dealings with the Celts. They began to make towns and even small settlements that could be called cities in a fashion. In the middle of the 8th century, they learned how to make their signature longboats, which was an incredible achievement. I'm going to explain a bit of that now. A longboat's construction had a mixture of both Celtic and Mediterranean styles, the former being the skin boats made of caulking and placing skins on a frame, and the latter being the so-called skeleton constructions. Longboats were built using the clinker technique, in which the lower edge of each hull plank overlaps the upper edge of the one below, set in place by iron rivets. The cracks are then sealed with moss or animal hair and tar and left to dry. The carved, smooth curvature of the wood, and more importantly the shape of the longboat, allowed it to ride the waves rather than fight them as most ships did, particularly the ships in the Mediterranean. <clears throat> the longboats were swift and dangerous vessels to face. In fact, for 300 years, the Vikings had no rivals at sea. The only rivals they had were one another. Charlemagne did not even attempt to create a navy to guard his realm. Instead, he made strategic forts around the coastlines and river openings to guard his realm. When Alfred the Great made a navy, it was obliterated. Longboats were also not only effective in naval warfare, but they rowed very low in the water, meaning they could beach anywhere and needed no port, which made it hard for Charlemagne even after creating all the castles. And they were also river-worthy. Vikings often attacked seemingly out of nowhere from any coastal or river area. They were also light enough to be carried by only a handful of men over long distances. It was often how Norwegians would travel to Ireland. They would pass over the narrower points of Scotland over land, hauling their longships, taking shifts on who carries the boats. The Scandinavians were quite ingenious when it came to crafting. They developed the longboats through trial and error and their own ingenuity, rather than using any government institutions or the engineers and scholars of Frankish Europe. They carved their myths and legends into beautiful metalwork and woodwork just by learning the trade from foreigners. You could say the Viking Age is an oddity among history. Yes, the Vikings were more advanced than their Germanic ancestors, however, they did not have any of the benefits of the civilized, Christianized mainland, yet they militarily and logistically dominated Europe and even parts of the Mediterranean and Slavic Russia for centuries. Now let's take a short look at the societal structure of Scandinavia. For one, traditional kings were not used yet. Instead they had jarls, or chieftains. Denmark, Norway, and Sweden were not nations under single rulers. They were simply regions created by mountain ranges, forests, and the Baltic Sea. However, there were what historians call sea kings, which were essentially jarls who led armies of or large-scale raiding groups looking for conquest and land. However, they only became such when they left Scandinavia looking for such things. As you can tell, I'm trying not to speak too much on military matters or mythology matters as of yet because they will have their own videos. However, you must understand their religion shaped their society. Uh, for instance, in the myths, it was Heimdall that gave the Scandinavians their three levels of society, apparently. As it stands, Jarls were the head of the three levels of society. I know it's a terrible segue, but either way. Uh, they were proud warriors and ruled with charisma and talent. If they proved themselves unable to lead or rule, they could easily be cast out. Most Scandinavians, however, were in the middle level, which were called freemen. Freemen were landowners. They were all skilled in warfare and hunting. Yet their careers were blacksmith, tailors, shipwrights, carpenters, you name it. Now before I get into the third level, I'll take a minute to describe the Scandinavian diet and its effects on society as it leads into a few of the careers freemen held. The Scandinavians weren't much larger than 
those in continental Europe, however, they did stand a tad taller and were constantly noted by chroniclers for their muscular physiques. They were broad-chested and broad-shouldered, with many of their men being burly. To a lesser degree, this was due to Bergman's rule, which is a biological rule for mammals. In case you don't know, I nearly became a zoologist before I majored in history, which gives me some extra insight sometimes. Who knew? Where scientists have noted that mammals tend to be larger and heavier the further away they are from the equator, to help them retain heat in cold climates. It's also a trait of humans as well, since humans are mammals, though only to a minuscule degree. The more important factor was their diet. As Scandinavia was a harsh land of ice and snow, and the Scandinavians did not have the modern utilities of indoor heating or takeout foods, they became hard people and needed to find any ways they could to survive. Farming was something they could only do for a very limited time of the year, so vegetables were not often a part of their diet. Instead, their diet consisted of wholemeal bread made of rye, oat and barley porridge, chicken, fish, sheep, lamb, goat, horse, ox, calf, and pig, cheese, butter, cream, milk, seal and walrus meat, whale meat, and even polar bear meat at times. In the forested areas, they would hunt elk, deer, boar, bear, hares, and geese, and in the far north, reindeer and bison. As you can see, they had a very protein-rich diet. This diet, along with their active hunting and hardworking lifestyles, gave them muscles and physiques that were the envy of both Christians and Muslims alike. However, just to note, for variety, they also had apples, berries, and hazelnuts in abundance, and the most common vegetables were cabbage and onions. You can see the disparity here, however. Because of this reliance for meat, animal husbandry, particularly cattle driving, was seen as a more noble profession than farming and agriculture. Not to say that they disliked farmers, but I suppose a good comparison would be to call the farmers the Viking Age garbage men, and the cattle drivers the Viking Age UPS men. Both did similar jobs, but one was seen as more attractive in terms of career. Now, onto the third level of society, the lowest form, known as the thralls, or slaves. Now, there weren't a lot of slaves in Viking society, at least compared to the free men. However, Scandinavia was the very center of the northern slave trade. They would raid Britain and continental Europe, looking for captives to be sold off as slaves just as much as they were looking for gold or conquest. The Swedes, for instance, had a very lucrative business enslaving people east of Scandinavia in the rivers that ran from the Baltic Sea into Europe. I'm sorry, Eastern Europe, all the way into the Black Sea and into the Byzantine Empire, leading to Constantinople. It might come as a surprise to you, but the Scandinavians traveled all the way into the Orthodox and Muslim worlds. I'll give a reference. You need to understand that the Swedes, Danes, and Norwegians were in every part of Viking excursions. Meaning, if there was a Danish raid going on, likely there would be some Swedes and Norse in there. Norwegians in there, I mean. However, for the most part, <clears throat> the Viking Age had each region focusing on certain areas. The Norwegians had a huge presence in Scotland, Ireland, Iceland, Greenland, and Vinland, Vinland meaning North America, whereas the Danes mostly attacked Frankish Europe and Southern England, and the Swedes focused eastward. The Swedes invaded into the forest zones in the rivers of Eastern Europe, allying with a few Slavic tribes and horse archer nomads, though they attacked and enslaved far more Slavs than allied with them. In fact, the English term for slave comes from the word Slav. The Swedes took so many captives and sold them off. By the end of the Viking Age, millions of people were taken and sold off, mostly to the Caliphate in the Middle East. What slaves that were kept in Scandinavia were not particularly ill-treated, however, at least as far as slaves go. Even some Vikings who owed debts they couldn't pay became thralls for an agreed-upon period of time to settle their debts. Now to finish off this introductory lesson, I'm going to give a quick word on how the Vikings had such a vast impact on changing history. I won't speak too much into it because I need to save certain explanations for other videos, so for now this will suffice. Viking attacks on the Carolingian Empire, which was the current dynasty of the Franks, and continental Europe bankrupted Europe. It saw the sacking of many cities, including Paris at least twice. The bankruptcy was the original reason medieval Europe began to hand out land to vassals rather than paying them creating the feudal system, because the Frankish kings had no more money to spend on defense or to blackmail Vikings to leave them alone. A Viking named Rollo, some think he was Danish, others Norwegian, 
was offered a fiefdom by Charles the Simple to halt his ambitions of raiding the Franks and to actually protect the coasts of northern Francia. And Rollo agreed, creating the county, eventually duchy, of Normandy. And it's called Normandy because the Northmen dwelled there, or the Normani. And Normandy became the single most influential duchy in all of Europe until the 13th century, providing the greatest knights and adventurers and was the main reason the Crusaders were successful in the First Crusade. Yes, exactly. You guessed it right. The First Crusaders were the descendants of Vikings, and they weren't far back descended. It was about three or four generations since the Vikings settled there that they were then the Normans that raided into Italy, Sicily, the Byzantine Empire, and eventually were on the First Crusade. Meanwhile, Danes attacking England decimated four out of the five English kingdoms, the only one remaining being Wessex under Alfred the Great, England's founder, which left all of it, all of England, to be eventually under Alfred the Great's rule, so it essentially created the country of England. The English language, already a Germanic language, would then proceed to add over 600 Danish words into its vocabulary, as a lot of the Danes, after their conquests, would settle in England. As this happened, the Norse integrated into and helped create the nations of Ireland and Scotland in similar fashions, and settled in Iceland, which produced some of the greatest epics and literature in all of the medieval world. And the Swedes, in particular the tribe of the Rus, would settle in Eastern Europe and create the original proto-states of Russia. Yes, the word Rus is how the word Russia came to form. The Swedes also traveled southward and became allies of the Byzantines, creating the famed Varangian Guard that led to Byzantine victories for centuries to come. Essentially, the Byzantine Empire's greatest fighting force was a standing army of Vikings. Not to mention the trade the Scandinavians kept up with whomever would trade with them over the entire period. I realize I'm giving a sweeping generalization of history, but just understand that the Vikings directly led to the development of over 3,000 miles of the medieval and modern world with their audacity and adventurous nature. They were more than simple raiders or barbarians. They were the catalyst that led to the medieval era, being civilization's greatest threat, yet also the greatest driving force for progress. Now, that's all I have for today. Tune in next time when I'll be discussing the Norse myths and delving deeper into the Scandinavian society. Have a great day, guys.